So you know there's more going on than meets the eye, don't you? That there's something else happening behind the, the curtain, beyond the layers of this world. You, you feel it in your life, don't you? That there are these circumstances, these events that happen, these reactions that occur in your journey, but you feel there's something else, right? A different pressure, a different influence. Do you see it? You know that argument you had where, yes, it was your action, you got angry, you yelled, words were spoken, but there was something else, this other pressure, this flash of rage, this, this intensity, this energy that's, you know, more than the offense that you were getting angry about. Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe you got sideways with somebody at work, and yes, it was your behavior, your misstep, you bust an expectation, and, and you kind of know it, you feel bad about it, but, but now there's this other kind of voice, this sense of alienation. Whether it's real or perceived, you feel like now you've been separated from these people that, that you care about at work, and you feel this dissonance you just can't seem to get over. Am, am I in the right room? You guys with me? <laughs> As we age, our bodies begin to change, and we don't really like what we see in the mirror. Some of you young folks, wait your turn. It's coming, right? And, you know, it's us. It's our American diet we've eaten our whole life. It's us who consume the social media or the Hollywood imagery of what your body should be. And we see people looking at us, and it's us who think, I don't know, right? But you feel this other energy, this voice inside you telling you that you are not enough, that you're ugly, that your identity, you question your own identity because of the outer shell that you live in called your body. Are you there? You face discouragement. Maybe the discouragement even gets even deeper and it would fall into a category we might even call depression. And yes, there are actual circumstances in your life you wish were better. There are pains in your journey that you wish didn't hurt as much as they did and you know, circumstances like that. But there's this other voice behind you that's speaking into you a message of hopelessness, that this is all there is. Maybe it's an addiction for you or a sin struggle or something about your life that yes, it's your choice to drink or to look or to use, and yet this voice that says, this is all that you are. This is your final destination. Friends, human beings in every single culture since the beginning of time have had this innate sense that there is more to, to what's going on, that it is not only what we see, that there is something deeper at play. It's the source, the foundation for every religion. It's why human beings have been looking to faith to say there's, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something else that explains this. It's also been the theme of a great number of wonderful works of art or theater or even film. In 1939, this phrase, look behind the curtain, became very popular by a movie called The Wizard of Oz. Maybe you saw it. It's a story about this little girl, Dorothy, and her dog, Toto, and they get swept away by a tornado in Kansas and land in this fantastical place called Oz. And it's all about them trying to get home, and they're told the wizard will help them out, and, you know, it's all frustrating, and all these, you know, encounters and so forth, and spoiler alert, they discover the wizard is nothing more than an insecure, awkward old professor behind a curtain pulling levers and making all these things happen, right? Pastor John, you were a wee young lab when this came out. No, actually, you're not that old, right? Well, in my generation, um, they came up with uh, Hollywood kept at it. It was in 1998. It was the Truman Show. It was a movie about a young man named Truman Burbank who his entire life, he grew up on a Hollywood set and didn't know it. Every relationship was fake. It, they were actors. Every circumstance being guided by the evil uh, executive director, Christoph, who was pulling all the strings behind the soundstage. And the movie is about Truman kind of waking up to the reality there's something more than what I think. A year later, Hollywood kept going. It was The Matrix. Remember this one? Where bored and lonely and kind of wiped out computer programmer Neo meets Morpheus, who tells him the reason your life is so gray is it's not real. Take the pill 
and you'll see behind the curtain that you're actually just living in a computer-generated uh, you know, uh, simulation while the robots drain all the energy out of your body. You remember this? I'm showing my age by these illustrations. So I contacted my uh, trusted uh, Gen Z consultants, two beautiful 23-year-olds who live in my house, and I asked them, and they reminded me of uh, a, a TV show on Netflix these days called Manifest, where passengers who thought they died on an airplane really hadn't, and they're being supernaturally guided. They reminded me of the Hunger Games, where uh, game makers are controlling the situation from the outside, or Divergent, the movie that, where these higher-ups are controlling how people act society. They are choosing characters for them. You get the point, right? That our quest, friends, to see behind the curtain, to recognize there's something more, this quest is insatiable. It's as if something is telling us, you need to understand this. You need to get behind the curtain and to see what is really at play. Well, there's another movie that was written. It's fantastical. It's every bit like the Lord of the Rings and then some. Only this one's not based on fiction. It was actually based on a very real revelation that God himself gave to a man named John Barzebedee. He was the best friend of Jesus Christ. And God, in his elderly years, called John into a vision to see behind the curtain, literally to go into the spiritual realms and to see reality. It was called the revelation of Jesus Christ, that God said, come on up into heaven and let me show you what's going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. And 1,928 years ago, John did his best to write it down, and it is absolutely fantastical. Right in the middle of this his description, he writes, uh, it's uh, 22 chapters, I believe, he writes of this narrative, this experience, and right in the middle of it, he, he, there's an episode where it captures uh, this fantastical story, four main characters in it. There's a woman, and there's her child, uh, her firstborn son, and then there are the other offsprings, a group of brothers, and then there's a dragon. Now, this woman is very beautiful. She's adorned in a crown. She's got 12 stars on her head that represent uh, her family and the extended family. And, and, uh, and, and she's been given wings by God to protect her, to drive her into uh, safety. But she's pregnant. She's pregnant with her firstborn, a son, who is destined to change the entire course of human history, to rule the nations, to, in other words, to affect change in the nations with great strength and power. And then her other kids, her offspring, and they're all caught in this cosmic struggle with this dragon, this dark, beastly creature who's, we're told, is incredibly intelligent, that he's very powerful that he's a part of the ruling elite, the governing elite of the world. He's so influential, this dragon, that he talks a third of the angels in heaven into following him and abandoning God. And he's in this constant struggle. His goal, his chief aim is to devour the child of this woman and to make war against her other offspring, to lead everyone astray. But there's a twist to the plot. This group of brothers, they're going to overcome the dragon. Turns out he's not strong enough. The plot line goes like this, that there was a great war as he sought to devour the child and to destroy this, the brotherhood. But he was not strong enough, and he lost his place in heaven. And he was hurled down. And then the episode ends with him still trying, the dragon still trying. Kind of like, remember Star Wars, the first Star Wars ends with Darth Vader, the rebels have overcome, but Darth Vader, the last scene is Darth Vader's spinning out of control out into the outer space with sort of this kind of foreshadowing that he's still out there trying to, trying to fight, but it's already been made known, he is a weakling. You wanna read this story together? <laughs> or you're going, whoa, this is freaky. <laughs> you've seen the Lord of the Rings. You've seen fantasy movies, right? Well, let's look at one that's real. Grab your Bibles. Let's go to the very last book, the book of Revelation, the very end. Revelation chapter 12. Let's look at this together. So um, online, it'll pop up on screen, but grab a physical Bible. Uh, get there to Revelation chapter 12, the very, very end of the book. Uh, really intense story.
Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 begins this way. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. Now pause there. That word sign, it's an, it means an ordinary, an extraordinary spectacle, an event that points beyond itself. In other words, this is what, it, what we're about to read is not a singular, precise event. Rather, it is a grand image with important and broad meaning. Now, you've probably been intimidated by the book of Revelation before. Maybe you've been interested in it enough to go look, and there's been some classes you took on it or whatnot uh, at some point. Maybe you've seen some of the movies that have been uh, made to try to tell the story of Revelation. There's, and there's different ways to look at the book of Revelation. Some, uh, some scholars think that the book of Revelation is entirely about events happening in the first century while John uh, Barzebedee wrote these words, right? Uh, others believe that Revelation is describing uh, all of human history from, the, from John's time, from the first century on to the end of the world. There are others who think the book of Revelation is telling us all about, exclusively about end time events that are yet to come. That's actually the most popular in American uh, theology these days. Most Americans think Revelation tells the story of the end times. It's most popular for our culture, but is frankly the weakest theologically. And there are others who say Revelation is really a symbolic picture of timeless eternal truths. Now, here's the good news. The writers of the NIV commentary say that, that fortunately, the fundamental truths of Revelation, the message of Revelation, does not depend on adopting a particular view of what it means. Good news, because no one has figured it out. They've been debating it for centuries, and we're not going to solve it either. So we're not going to try to interpret what the bigger picture is. But to look at this one episode where it's a sign more than a singular event, a grand image, a picture of something that's happening behind the scenes. Friends, this is our chance to look behind the curtain. Let's read it. Chapter 12, verse 1. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And she was pregnant... And she cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. In John's imagery here, the stars speak of angels or, um, or, or kind of leaders, if you will. And so most scholars would believe this woman and the 12 stars on her crown represent the 12 tribes of Israel, that this woman is Israel. This woman is the people of God. We learned about last week how God chose a man named Jacob and named him Israel, which means struggles with God, the family, the people who wrestle with God. And this woman is Israel. And these are the 12 of tribes and she is pregnant with a son. Any guess who that might be? Out of the people of Israel would be born a son of a virgin and his name was called Jesus. Verse 3. Then another sign appeared. An enormous red dragon with seven heads meaning he is incredibly smart. The word number seven to them often meant perfection. So he is perfectly smart. Seven heads and 10 horns, 10 being perfect or seven being perfect plus three. This guy, he had horns speak of power. He is immensely powerful, this dragon. And seven crowns on his head. In other words, he's involved in all of governing. He's a ruler, if you will. His tail swept a third of the stars, a third of the angels out of heaven and flung them to the earth. There are other places in the Bible that describe the fall of Satan, that he was in fact at one time an archangel, a heavenly being created by God to be a part of the family of angels. But his, his deception was so great that he convinced a third of the angels to go with him. And that's what we know is the spiritual realm, uh, demonic realms. Latter part of verse four goes on. So the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. You know, a part of the Christmas story we don't often talk about, but right when Jesus was born, King Herod, who was profoundly influenced by this dark dragon, this ruler of rulers, if you will, 
King Herod was so threatened in his political power that he ordered every young child in Bethlehem to be murdered. The dragon sought to devour Jesus the moment he was born. But verse 5, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. The concept of scepter, think about in our context of a gavel. You know, the Speaker of the House has a gavel or a judge has a gavel, right? That's a ruling instrument. And, this, and that's kings back then. They carried scepters, similar concept. And he would be given iron, which was back then was a great metal of strength. In our context, we'd probably call it a titanium gavel. <laughs> right? And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The devil sought to devour. This dragon sought to devour the son of the living God. And what happens to him? He, the, the dragon thought the crucifixion was the end of the, end of the game. The dragon thought he'd won uh, by, by crucifying Jesus Christ. But you know what happened three days later, don't you? The death could not hold him. That what was thought was a victory for the dragon turned not to be. And he was resurrected to new life and carried up into the throne room of God. I know that sounds fantastical, friends, but it has been recorded by both secular and religious history alike. The evidence profound that the resurrection of Jesus Christ literally occurred in Israel uh, 2,000 some years ago. And this narrative, this dragon thought he'd won, but he hadn't. And this child is snatched up into heaven. Are you with me? Verse 6. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. That's three years and 23 weeks, friends, just shy of three and a half years. Interesting thought. This woman and her offspring are Israel and us, the church, the body of God's people. Jesus Christ, most scholars believe, was executed and put to death on uh, April 3rd, 33 AD. And the church thrived after the resurrection for exactly three and a half years. And in 36 AD, the persecutions began. God protected his people in those early days. And then it got tough. Verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. <laughs> but he, he was not strong enough. And they, the dragon and his angels, they lost their place in heaven. And that great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. The Hebrew word Satan means accuser. The great, this great dragon, this ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth and his angels with him. He, friends, was not strong enough. And then verse 10. Then John says, I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. Do you notice the word now? This means present tense right now in this space. There's this cosmic battle going on. But now our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ has brought salvation. You're here today and you feel that other voice behind you. And Jesus is here to save you from that. You hear that other condemning voice, that other pressure, that other, other influence. Well, Jesus Christ is the one who has supreme power. You feel that pressure and that influence, that darkness that surrounds us in the world and evil things happen like they did in California last night. But yet it is now present tense that the kingdom of God exists and the authority of Jesus Christ to make a difference. You say, but I, I, I don't see it. Well, hold on. 
It is now, this loud voice saying, now has come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before God day and night, he has been hurled down. That word accuse, that's his whole identity. The word Satan, as we mentioned, means accuser. This is his modus operandi, that he gets in your face uh, through that little voice in your head, through that pressure you feel, through that doubt and those fears that, that rack up in your mind. That's, that's the enemy accusing. And the word accusing, the concept here, is like a, like a prosecuting attorney. It's a legal term that he stands before God bringing a legal case against you. He is constantly berating you before God and saying, you're not, this person's not worthy enough. This person's broken. This person's too addicted. This person has too much shame. This person's not good enough. That's his argument in front of God day after day after day. And God said, get out out of here and throws him out of court. He has been hurled down. Verse 11. So they, meaning the brothers, the, all the offspring of this woman, guess who that includes? This is you. All of the offspring of this, this woman, the, this beautiful woman with her 12 starred crown, this people of God to whom the enemy accuses over and over again. That's you, friends. That's me. And they overcame him, the dragon, by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much to shrink from death. So therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Do you see it, friends? This is a cosmic struggle, I know. This is a freaky narrative, I know. This is a Lord of the Rings movie on steroids, I know. But it is a narrative that is showing you what's going on behind the curtain that you and I don't see. And he is saying, you have overcome that nasty dragon. <laughs> but <laughs> as good movies always have, there's a but. Latter part of verse 12. But woe to the earth. And the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury, for he knows that his time is short. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he'd been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, where she would be taken care of for time and times and half a time out of the serpent's reach. But then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman, sweep her away with a torrent. But even the earth opened up and helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river the dragon had spewed out. I get this imagery, friends. I don't know if this is an accurate interpretation, but I get this imagery of how you know how the people of God have been pursued over and over again. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago, all the martyrs of the Christian faith, the Roman Empire pursuing them, even martyrs today in nations around the world being pursued. But yet it seems that even humanity every so often comes up for air and puts an end to these atrocities. You remember the atrocities in the 1940s against God's people, the Jewish people, right? And the atrocities that were going on in Europe. And yet the world rose up and even the earth swallows this torrent the enemy is trying to bring. Verse 17, the dragon was enraged at the woman. And he went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Those who obey God's commandments and who hold to the testimony of Jesus. This is a heavy story. But friends, do you see it? This is why things are so difficult. This is why you're having trouble punching past that addiction in your life. This is why those relationships with the people you love the most are often the most frictional. This is why when you and I trip up and we make a mistake, we don't know how to receive the grace of God. 
This is why when we look in the mirror, we don't see a temporary shell that is merely housing in an imperfect way a beautiful creation of God. What we see is someone who's overweight or someone who's decaying and, and, we, and we repulse our, at ourselves. This isn't coming from God. This is this angry dragon. The, the movie is continuing. Darth Vader has spun off into outer space, but he's coming. Every narrative has this story, right? But what does it tell us about him? That he is a weakling and he has been hurled down. It's a crazy, fantastical story, friends, but it is God's revelation to John Bar Zebedee, John, the son of Zebedee, who was best friends of Jesus Christ. And God said, come here for a minute, John. I need to show you something and I need you to write it down because for the next multiple centuries, people are gonna need to hear this. Would you come with me, John? Come back behind this curtain and would you see what's really going on so that God's people would know? And you say, okay, I'm thoroughly freaked out. <laughs> so what am I supposed to do with this? Four things. Number one, recognize, friends, recognize the reality of the battle in your life, in my life. Recognize the role of the accuser. He is present. Recognize his voice. Here, here's what you and I can do is learn to recognize his voice. When we hear that, that, that pressure behind us, that sense of inadequacy, that sense of alienation, that sense that we don't belong, that sense there's something wrong with us, that sense that I'm not made in God's image, I'm not how I should be, that pressure, recognize where that's coming from. That isn't coming from a reality that you have created. That's coming from a dragon who is trying to pursue and accuse and tear down God's beloved people. Recognize his voice and its impact over you. In other words, friends, do not underestimate the influence that this deception has on you and me. Don't underestimate his ability to get inside your head and to mess with you. What you are wrestling with is not all natural. So the solutions are not all natural. If I could just get this circumstance to change, then I'd stop. No, if this person would stop being a jerk, then no, it's more than that. So recognize that influence. Is that making sense? But friends, catch this. While you and I need to recognize the the role of this accuser and not underestimate his influence over us and how much we might be buying and swallowing of his message. But, number two, we need to recognize the fundamental weakness of the enemy. It does not say he will be hurled down. It says he has been. God's thrown this slippery critter out of court. God has dismissed the case. I don't want to hear from you, devil, anymore. Get out. <laughs> See, don't, un don't underestimate his influence. <laughs> and friends, this is a choice you and I make to, s to buy his message, to, agree, to, to let, it, let that influence, to, because we don't recognize it's there. We don't, we're kind of going through our day, and we're just doing our thing, and we're operating in the natural realm, and there's this pressure. We don't even recognize it. Okay, point one, recognize it's there. Recognize the battle. Be alert. Be attentive to it. But don't, under, don't overestimate his capacity. You remember earlier, about a year ago or so now, the Russians invaded Ukraine? You remember that? What did you think in those first 48 hours was going to happen? If you were paying attention, the U.S. called uh, Zelensky and said, hey, you want an airplane? We'll come get you. I, I thought, didn't you? I mean, this is the former Soviet empire. This is the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. This is the, this is the second largest army next to China and all the planet. And, and I've been to Russia a bunch of times. They're, they're, they're pretty intense people. When they want to fight, they're going to fight, right? You know, what do you think was going to happen? Game over within three days, right? So, <laughs> so did Putin, right? <laughs> I thought I would have, if you were Zelensky, what would you have done? <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> See y'all, right? What did it turn out? This enemy is a mess. 
This enemy is weak. And the whole world's gotten around uh, behind these guys. You, you get the picture? Now, don't underestimate his influence and his ability to terrify you and get you scared. But don't give him that credit. Don't give him that position. Don't overestimate his actual capacity and therefore give up the fight. You with me? Third, here's how we do it. You recognize, I recognize, we recognize the present tense victory of Jesus Christ in your life. Now, right now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom and the authority of our Jesus Christ. You say, I don't see him at work in the world. Well, where he's not, where he's not breaking through is where people are giving too much credit to the devil and listening to his voice. Those who will in faith turn their hearts to Jesus Christ and say, God, you are my salvation. God, you are my power. You are my kingdom to whom I belong. You, yours is the authority. Those who will turn that direction, they're living an abundant life just as Jesus promised. Don't overestimate the enemy. Don't underestimate him. But recognize the present tense victory. And then four. Recognize and engage our part. There's a part we play. What do I need to do and think and feel differently? Did you see it in Revelation 12, verse 11? That they overcame him. The brothers overcame the devil. How? By the blood of the lamb. This is the work of Jesus Christ. This is his supernatural uh, victory over you that he defeated the devil through that death, burial, and resurrection. Trust him. Look to him. And then it was their part was the word of their testimony and that they did not love their lives so much to shrink from death. They spoke up. We talked about a couple weeks ago that when they were facing mighty persecutions, uh, they were, they were going to get uh, tortured or executed for the faith in Christ. And they were standing up going, yep, I'm a Christian. Bring it on. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Some of us, we're afraid to be identified as a Christian because we're afraid some snowflake at work's hair is going to catch on fire when they find out we love Jesus, right? Uh, you know, we are afraid to, in, in this culture to be identified as a Christ follower, but in the Roman Empire, when John wrote, they're like, I'm in, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Friends, their victory was their identification that first and foremost, above any other identity, I'm not Republican, I'm not Democrat, I'm not fat, I'm not skinny, I'm not beautiful, I'm not ugly, I'm not strong, I'm not powerful, I'm not dumb, I'm not smart. Above any other identity, I am a child of God. I belong to Jesus Christ. The word of your testimony. And to not love your life so much as to even shrink to pull back from the worst that we might even face. Friends, this battle's real. I didn't want to teach this today because this stuff is kind of scary. I don't want you to have any nightmares tonight. I had one this week. I don't remember anything of it other than in literally in this nightmare. The devil was pounding on me I, somehow. I don't remember the details of it. The thing I remember is I woke up saying, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. And I didn't know why that was the dream. I woke up, it was probably Tuesday or Wednesday. I didn't even tell you about it. <laughs> they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Well, what's he doing? He's accusing in a court of law. And my plea is not guilty. My plea is not innocent. My plea is blood of Jesus. <laughs> Now, what's the part you and I need to think or do differently? So yesterday, I was still feeling a little insecure about this teaching, whether it was going to go over well or not. And I, uh, I'm sitting in my car yesterday morning uh, where I go to prepare. And I said, God, I kind of closed the Bible, put it aside. I said, all right, what do you want to tell me? Not y'all. I said, God, I, I, I'm struggling to get the words. So I... Not for them, God. What, what do you want to tell me? And he asked me two questions. These are for me, but they might be useful for you. Question one, God asked me, as a result of all this teaching, 
God says, which, Chris, which is my default reaction to stress and pain and conflict and frustration? Is my default reaction when I come under pressure, is my default reaction my identity in Jesus Christ? Or is it to quickly engage my self-guided solutions? To real quick run the math on whatever the stress point is, all right, how do I fix it? And to jump right in, right? And if that's the case, imagine if it's true of you, true of me, that when that's our default reaction, it means that our self has too much centrality. That the real salvation and power and kingdom and authority is Jesus Christ, not mine. The real overcoming reality to my stress points is not me, it's Jesus. Or is my reflex reaction, my default reaction to stress and pain to drop into victimhood or to blaming of others? Either the victimhood is self-loathing of myself or blaming of others is loathing other people. That my problems is because everybody else is a jerk. And when I do that, it's because the accuser has too much credibility. When I look to my own solutions, it's because I've made myself too central. When I look to you or, or my own self-loathing to explain my problems, it's because I'm giving the accuser too much credibility. How about you? Second question the Lord asked me. What would people most readily hear from your mouth? What would your spouse or your best friend or your closest coworker say of you? What's coming out of your mouth the most? Is it self-centered stuff? Negative, fretful, grandiose, self-absorbed, defeated victim? Or would they hear you others-centric? Now, the negative side of that would be that you're blaming other people, but there's also positive, you know, the really optimistic person who's empowering of other people, and hey, that's great, and we had dinner with a friend of ours this week uh, who's like the most optimistic guy on the planet. He's like, everything's great, you're what, right? Uh, and maybe even investing in other people, and, you know, and that's good, right? So you get that self-centered is bad. It's better to be others-centered, right? Minus the negative. But I don't want to just go from bad to better. I want to be best. And that's to be Christ-centered. That my view of self is redeemed. That my view of my circumstances is to praise God. And my view of other people is to be missional. How can I be Jesus Christ to them? Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's coming out of my mouth, they overcame him by the word of their testimony. What comes out of my mouth betrays what's in my heart. They overcame the dragon because in their heart they'd squared up on this. They were Christ-centered. And what comes out is the word of their testimony. I am a child of God. Revelation 12, 11, They overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Ryan, John, worship team, you guys come on up. While they're coming, let me tell you one more story. I was told by my, one of my professors in college. It was one of these events in his life as a young man that was so impactful it marked him. He talked about his grandfather, who was a very godly man, and, and as, a, as a young boy, he was probably you know, junior high age, he and his granddad were going out into the fields, do something hiking or exploring or hunting or whatever it was, and they're going through this farm field, and granddad, who was a very godly man, um, they come up on this fence, and they get ready to climb over the fence, and granddad grabs the fence, and it's electric fence. And he gets full-blown electrocuted. And the instinctive reaction is like, praise God. <laughs> and it marked this young man that the word of his testimony, the instant reflex reaction to pain and circumstance was to worship Jesus. Would you stand and would you worship him with all your heart? We are... 
overwhelmed with joy at your authority, at your power, at your kingdom, at your salvation that you purchased. (laughs) This dragon thought he had you. He's been seeking to devour you since the day he fell out of heaven, but oh, Jesus, you overcame. Your blood was so powerful and rich. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that resurrection life poured into every one of us. Oh, God, thank you. God, give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear, God. Let it... Let us see beyond the veil, beyond that ordinary natural world. Let us see beyond it to see your power, to see your hand, and to trust you. To respond in faith. And we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.